So, Senator Paul, it is an honor to introduce you. You're a man of character and courage, and thank you so much for coming out tonight. Senator Rand Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, we're going to miss you, but I understand they have politics down in Florida. <laughs> They'll say, there's going to be something that we need you to do. In fact, hmm, what county are you going to be living in? We need to make sure we have your phone number down there. I stood about a week ago for 10 and a half hours trying to defend your right to privacy. And the first question I got from the media I kid you not, was, how does it feel to be the most unpopular person in Washington? I said, you know what? I don't really care how popular I am in Washington. Go outside the Beltway and meet the rest of America. The thing about this is, particularly young people, but really most Americans think the president went too far that collecting all of your records, all of your phone records, all of the time, without putting your name on a warrant, without individualizing the suspicion, was a bridge too far, that he'd gone too far. Even the courts said this. It went all the way up to the second highest court in the land, to the, appeal, to the appellate court, and they said, it's illegal, was never justified by the Patriot Act. The author of the Patriot Act, or one of the authors, James Sensenbrenner, still in Congress, said, no way in the world did we ever contemplate that the records collection part of the Patriot Act would let them collect everything. In fact, in the Patriot Act, it says you can collect records relevant to an investigation. The court said, hmm, if relevant means everyone, the word doesn't mean anything. So it became bizarre. But the president, like everything else, what does he do? It's Bush's fault. This time it wasn't Bush's fault, he said it was my fault. I was obstructing reform, but here's the deal. The president started this program on his own without any congressional authority, and then he told us to stop it. If that's not disingenuous, I don't know what is disingenu disingenuous. Can't even pronounce it anymore. But the thing is, is that People say, they say, well, how will we catch terrorists if we can't use this bulk collection? How will we get them? So I was walking down the hallway with a powerful U.S. senator, and he looked at me. This was actually the first time I tried to stop things, 2011. Steam was coming out of his ears, and he said, what will you do if the Patriot Act expires at midnight? And I said, well, couldn't we just rely on the Constitution for a few hours? <laughs> Can you catch terrorists with the Fourth Amendment? Can we protect ourselves with the Fourth Amendment? The Fourth Amendment says you have to have someone's name on a warrant, you have to have probable cause, you have to say what you're looking for, and then you have to ask a judge. We do it every day in our country. Dan was a policeman at one time, weren't you? Every policeman in every state in the union knows they cannot write their own warrant. You know where that came from? It came from the Fourth Amendment, but it came from James Otis's fight against something called writs of assistance. The British soldiers were writing them, and they wanted to say they could go in any house of the colonist because they wanted to see if your papers were stamped. It was the dreaded stamp tax that all the colonists hated. But the warrants, what they hated even more than the tax, was that the British soldiers could write their own warrants. So we wrote the Fourth Amendment. It's like so many of the wonderful things our founders did. They said there had to be checks and balances. The reason you have checks and balances is most of our police are good. I know we see some bad things that have happened, but don't forget that 98% of them are good people. That's not an excuse for the 2% that are rotten and need to be drummed out. But the 98% that are good do the right thing. If tonight in Baltimore there was someone in their house and someone says, we, there's a warrant for this rapist, 
We didn't see him go in, but somebody saw his neighbor saw him go in. That's enough, basically. You've got a warrant for his arrest. Someone says he's in there, but they still, they call the judge at three in the morning and the judge picks up the phone. I maintain we could catch more terrorists if we'd use real warrants and go as deep as you want into the haystack to find the records. The Boston bomber. During the debate, they're like, we need the Patriot Act or we couldn't get the Boston bomber. You had the Patriot Act and you didn't get the Boston bomber, okay? They were tipped off by the Russians. My guess is they could have built a probable cause case. A probable cause case under the Fourth Amendment doesn't mean a conviction. Conviction's harder to get. You've got to really have solid evidence. The jury's got to agree with you. You've got to convince a judge that there's some evidence that a crime's being committed. The Russians tipping us off that he might be a terrorist might be some of that evidence. But the thing is, is that people say, well, we just need more information and more information. Malcolm Gladwell's a writer and he said that good decision making is not about knowledge, it's about understanding. The FBI said last week, we don't have enough agents to look at all the potential terrorists in America. Why don't we do this? Why don't we cut out a billion dollars worth of indiscriminate phone records and hire a thousand new FBI agents? John Adams went to the court case and watched James Otis talking about warrants and talking about generalized warrants. And John Adams was 25 years old at the time. But what he said from this is he said it was the spark that led to the revolution. It was a big deal. We all talk about the Second Amendment now. We're the party of the Second Amendment, and that's good. But it was the Fourth Amendment that was the spark that led to the revolution. It was a big deal. It was a big deal whether you could generalize an assumption of guilt or whether you had to individualize. One of the reasons, even though most police are good, that we don't give the police the right to write the warrants is because there are times when we have generalized about people based on the color of their skin, based on their religion, based on we don't like those people. And that's why the checks and balances are to keep out systemic bias from a system. Checks and balances were probably one of the most important things that our founding fathers gave us. People will say to me, what is the worst thing the president has done? And I'll say, hmm, it's a long list. <laughs> We could start a shorter list of the good things that he's done. But the thing is, is the, the worst thing that he's done to our country, it isn't Obamacare, it isn't Dodd-Frank, it isn't one particular bill. It's the collapse of the separation of powers. We, we, we established these co-equal branches and Madison said that we were going to pit ambition against ambition, the ambition of Congress to jealously guard their power versus the president, to jealously guard or grab for power. And it was supposed to keep power from accumulating in one place too much. Montesquieu talked about this, and many give credit to Montesquieu for coming up with this concept of co-equal branches and checks and balances. But Montesquieu said that when the executive begins to legislate, a form of tyranny will ensue. We're getting closer and closer to that day. What's happening is more and more and more power is accumulating in the presidency. What's another word for the presidency? Bureaucracy, unelected bureaucrats. The sad thing that I learned when I came to Washington a few years ago is that the lowest level unelected bureaucrat often has more power than your congressman or your senator. People come, my constituents come from Kentucky and they complain about this rule putting them out of business or this thing putting them out of business and the regulations and all the red tape. I think to myself, did I vote for any of that? Nobody voted for any of it. Almost all of it is created out of whole cloth by a bureaucracy that's run amok. It didn't just happen. People say, oh, it's all President Obama. It's been going on since Woodrow Wilson or before. It just gets bigger and bigger. And this is the, the really the worst part of partisanship is sometimes there's a Republican president and a Republican Congress and we say, oh, that's our guy or that's our gal, we'll just let them do what they want and power accumulates. Then the Democrats do the same thing. And then decade after decade, power and power and power accumulates until you get things that were well-intended become horrific. 
I'll give you an example. The Clean Water Act, I would have voted for it. Can't discharge pollutants into the navigable waters. I don't want somebody dumping benzene into the Chesapeake Bay, and I'm not for big government, but I'm for government stopping any of you from dumping benzene into the lake. But over 40 years, we now define pollutants as dirt, and your backyard is a navigable stream. It would be funny if we weren't putting people in jail for it. A guy named Robert Lucas down in the southern part of Mississippi, 10 years ago, was 70 years old. He was put in prison for 10 years. He just got out. 10 years without parole, 10 years without early release. He was convicted of a RICO conspiracy. RICO is supposed to be something you go after gangsters for. You know what his conspiracy was? Conspiracy to put dirt on his own land. We've gone crazy, we've run amok, but it's this loss of the separation of powers, it's this loss of equilibrium. It really is something serious. It's what's allowed one branch to get run away, but it's also a Congress that's abdicated its duty. Spending runs on unabated. I mean, we borrow a million dollars every minute. In the next nine hours of this speech, imagine how much we're gonna borrow. <laughs> I think that's a scattering of applause for those who think I'm not serious, all right? We'll see. We face daunting challenges. Some of them are on both sides, and occasionally I get a little grief because I'm, I'm willing to stand up and say sometimes we've, we've not done the right things. There is a bipartisan compromise in Washington you need to be aware of. You know, everybody says we should have compromise. Everybody says we should hold hands and sing kumbaya and everything will be better. One of the things I think we could compromise on would be, I think maybe, and this was, I know this is going out on a limb, but maybe we could come together and say dead people should not get checks. <laughs> they came out with a report about a month ago that said that we passed out $17 million to dead people. What's worse than that, or I, I think what's sort of uh, hilarious about how this kind of stuff goes on is there was, uh, they've estimated because Social Security keeps really good records and keep, you know, you can count on them to keep your account safe, all right? The Social Security system said that there are 6.5 million people that are over 112 years old. <laughs> My guess is they need a little bit of work, you know, to figure something out here. But on the, in the name of compromise, we come together, but sometimes in the name of compromise, we compromise and do the wrong thing. On our side, we justifiably think defense is important, and I agree. I think the most important thing we do is national defense. It should be a priority, and if you ask me how will you prioritize what you spend, what will you vote for, I will always give priority to our national defense, without question. But if you ask me if that means a blank check, no. I think we should audit the Pentagon. You know, we cannot be weak. We cannot be strong by borrowing money from China, even if it's for something that we need, like national events. We certainly can't be strong by borrowing money from China to send it to Pakistan. One thing that annoys the, can I say hell? It annoys the hell out of me that we take money, we borrow it, and we send it to countries that hate us, that burn our flag and chant out to America. And I say, not one penny more. But here's the compromise we make. We just made it a year ago. We had something pass the sequester. And anybody who's in any kind of associated with government all, they'll say, oh, the sequester is so draconian. We have to get rid of the sequester. The sequester was a cut in the rate of increase. Over 10 years, government spending goes up under the sequester, no matter what anybody tells you, that's the truth. Now, in the first two years, there was a little dip down, and we got on a lower trajectory. That's how we got started, and that was a way we were gonna save money. It might have been the, the best cost-saving thing we did but it included a compromise where military had to hold the line and so did domestic spending, which is frankly the compromise in the direction we should go. But we ended up giving up on it. 
a year or two into it, we went ahead and cut out the little dip down in spending, and it's gone. So when people say, oh, the sequester's got to go, there is no sequester. There are some budget caps, all right? The budget caps are trying to keep us from bankrupting the country. If you want compromise, the compromise has to be in the opposite direction. I'll give you an example. There was an amendment, and it was by another presidential candidate on our side, to increase defense spending. And I said, well, I want people to know that I am for that, but I can't vote for it if we're not going to cut a corresponding amount of other spending. So I introduced the same amendment as this other candidate, exact same dollar amount, and I said, but I'm cutting it over here because I cannot act on defense. The biggest threat to our national security is our debt. If we spend ourselves into oblivion, we will not be able to defend the country. I think you do want a commander in chief who will defend the country though, without question. You know, there's conservatives, there's liberals, there's this and that, there's all kind of variety of all of us. But I think you want somebody who will defend the country. And when I think of all the things the president's done wrong, all of the things Hillary Clinton's been a part of, also a, lost, a long list, <laughs> and you ask me what's the worst thing, what's the worst scandal among all of the scandals that have gone on, I say without question it's Benghazi. <laughs> and it goes to the heart of the matter about who you're going to choose to be the commander in chief. There is a commander in chief question. You have to believe that whoever we're going to nominate or whoever we're going to elect will defend the country. It wasn't the talking points and the spin afterwards. Not for me. It wasn't that night. It wasn't that we didn't respond appropriately, although I didn't think our response could have been better. For me, the commander-in-chief question was for nine months leading up to Benghazi. Time after time, request after request, denied. We need more security. We fear we're going to be overrun. Denied. They started letting the troops go in February of this year, of that year, 2012. You have to realize this was a war zone. This is one of the most dangerous places on earth. There was six-man personnel, uh, special forces team in February left. March, another six-man personnel, uh, special forces team, gone. April 1st, I believe, the dates could be off a little bit if anybody's ever checking facts. In the spring, they requested DC-3. The ambassador says that we'd like to have a plane to fly around the country or to leave the country if we have to. Denied. Three days later, after Hillary Clinton's State Department denies a DC-3, a 50-year-old plane or more, she approves a charging station for the Vienna Embassy, $100,000 because it seems they were greening up the embassy. They wanted to have a bunch of Chevy Volts, but then they forgot you have to have a different kind of plug to plug them in. So they spent a hundred grand on a charging station, meanwhile sending our boys home that were defending the consulate. You get to the summertime. What was Hillary Clinton spending the money on? That summer, $650,000 were spent on Facebook ads. Seems they didn't have enough friends on the State Department, Facebook. They spent 700000 on the lawn, on landscaping in Brussels. They spent $5 million on crystal barware. They didn't have a penny to defend Benghazi. When it comes to August, Colonel Wood was there. You remember Colonel Wood? He was in charge of a 16-person team. This is the, the last remaining force of any kind of size there to protect the ambassador. He writes cable after cable saying, we've got to stay. It's more dangerous with each day. The British ambassador has been attacked. There are jihadists everywhere. We're protected by the militia, the Libyan militias who they were counting on. And so when Hillary Clinton came before my committee, I asked her that question. I said, did you read the cables? And her answer to me was like, huh. you know, she kind of acted as if she had better things to do. And she said, no, I didn't. And the whole hearing was about how somebody else's fault, not her fault. But you know what? From her inability to give us security for our troops, from her denying troops, denying reinforcements, it should forever preclude her from being president.
If we want to win elections, we need to be a big party. I tell people we got to have people with tattoos and without tattoos, with long hair, without, with earrings, black, white, brown, rich, poor, working class. We got to be a more diverse party. I think the way we become a more diverse party is, I think we need to be a party of the entire Bill of Rights. The Second Amendment, we're great on. If you have all 55 people running for president come here, <laughs> you'll find that at least 54 out of 55 are probably good on the Second Amendment. <laughs> but we need to be the, one, the party that defends the First Amendment, religious freedom, religious liberty. and freedom for most of the press. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. We need to be the party of the Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy, the right to be left alone. Justice Brandeis, <laughs> Justice Brandeis says that the right most cherished, the right to be left alone is the right to be most cherished and most prized among civilized men. But we also need to be the party of the Fifth and Sixth Amendment. I call these the Justice Amendments. Fifth Amendment says the government can't take your property without compensation. And after the Kelo case, I frankly think we need to make it explicit to all of them, they should never ever take private property from one person and give it to another private property owner. The Sixth Amendment says you have the right to a trial. And you're thinking, well, who's not for that? Well, let me let you know there is a problem with the right to a trial. There are people who now say in this war on terror, American citizens don't always get a right to a trial. We had this debate. A law was passed in 2011 that allows indefinite detention. And I was debating with another senator, and I don't like to name names, but he was from Arizona. And I looked at him and I said, an American citizen could be sent to Guantanamo Bay without a trial? And he said, yeah, if they're dangerous. I said, it kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Who gets to decide who's dangerous and who's not? Anybody remember Richard Jewell? Everybody said he was the Olympic bomber. He was convicted by the TV cameras. Within hours, they said he did it. He met the profile. He had glasses. I see a few of you out there. <laughs> He looked like a geek. That's like half of my campaign staff. <laughs> he had a backpack on, and they said he did it. He had to do it. He was suspicious looking. But here's the thing that were wrong. Think if Richard Jewell had been a black man in 1920 in the South, what might have happened to him? This is why we have checks and balances. This is why you get a warrant, not because police are bad, but because somebody might be bad. You get these checks and balances to, to root out prejudice and racism and bias. You can be a minority because of the color of your skin, but you can also be a minority because of the shade of your ideology. You can be a minority because you're an evangelical Christian or you want to teach your kids at home. I tell you what, you can be a homeschooler and you better hope that you don't get sent to prison without a trial, without a lawyer. People say, oh, that's absurd. Guy that works for me in Kentucky, or what used to work for me in Kentucky, his parents were indicted and given a year in prison for teaching their kids at home. They didn't serve. We got up on our, we decided we'd change the law. But the thing is, the law is not about having good people. Madison said that if men were angels, we'd need no rules. We'd need no constitution to restrain government if men were angels. But guess what? Men aren't angels. The law is about preventing those who are not angels from abusing your rights. The right to a trial by jury, it also says you have the right to a speedy trial. And I've been telling this story for about a year and a half, two years now, and it, it makes me sad. And I've, I thought about not talking about it or doing the story again, but I think that this young man's memory should help us to try to change things. He died this weekend, he committed suicide. His name was Khalif Browder. He was a 16-year-old black teenager from the Bronx. He was arrested, accused of a crime, and put in Rikers Island for three years without a trial. He spent two of those years in solitary confinement. He was beaten to a pulp by a gang in the prison. 
without ever being convicted of a crime. Even if you're convicted of a crime in America, for goodness sakes, are we going to let people be raped and murdered and pillaged in prison because they've been convicted? He wasn't even convicted. So when I see people angry and upset, I'm not here to excuse violence in the cities, but when I see people angry, I understand where some of the anger is coming from. Now, there's a proper way to, to figure this out. I went to Ferguson. I said, set up voter registration tables and register to vote and register everybody that's unhappy to vote. So there is a constructive way of doing this. But I can tell you, I didn't grow up poor. I grew up middle class or upper middle class. This is me learning about how other people have to deal with life. And this young man, 16 years old, Imagine how his classmates feel about American justice. Imagine how his parents feel. So the thing is, until you walk in someone else's shoes, I think we, wouldn't, we shouldn't say that we can't understand the anger of people. But there's a constructive way of doing something better. The Democrats have utterly failed our inner cities. They've utterly failed the poor. The war on poverty is now a war on the poor. And don't let you tell them it wasn't them. Don't let them tell us it wasn't them. A lot of these policies came from Bill Clinton. In Ferguson, for every 100 black women, there are 60 black men. Because the other 40 we've incarcerated. Now, am I saying they did nothing wrong and it's all racism? No. But what I am telling you is that white kids don't get the same justice because the police go where there are more people. There are more people where there's more concentration in the cities and there are more African Americans. But it adds up over time. The arrests in Baltimore are 15 to 1, black to white for marijuana arrests. If you do surveys, the statistics are pretty close between black and white and marijuana use. I'm not saying it's racism. Many of your officials are black, so it's not racism. But something's wrong with the war on drugs, that we decided to lock people up for 5, 10, 15 years for making mistakes. And I don't want you to get the idea that I think it's good either. I think drugs are bad, even marijuana. I think if you smoke marijuana every day, you're probably not going to be that productive. So I'm not here to extol marijuana. But I am here to say it's a mistake. It's a huge mistake to be putting people and locking them up. One young lady in Illinois and in, in Iowa the other day, she was given 15 years for a nonviolent. She was an addict and she was ruining her life, but 15 years in prison. So I think we need to rethink this. But we also have to rethink the war on poverty. Unemployment for black men aged 20 to 25 in Baltimore is 37%. To put that in perspective, in the Great Depression, it was 22%, and that was a horrific time. So we need to imagine what's going on, and we need to figure out a better way. I have a plan called Economic Freedom Zones that would dramatically lower the taxes in several zip codes in Baltimore, Chicago, Philadelphia, Ferguson. And what we do is we wouldn't give them somebody else's money. We'd let them keep their own money and say, well, they're poor. They don't pay taxes. In every one of the poor neighborhoods, there are people paying taxes. People have the McDonald's, a dry cleaner, maybe a factory, maybe a shoe store. We'd lower the taxes on the business people so they'd hire more people. The best chance of getting a kid on the right path is to have a job. You showed that you can win in Maryland. I think we can win across the country when we become a bigger, more diverse, more inclusive party, but also just a party that defends the entire Bill of Rights. We don't have to dilute what we stand for. We just have to take our message and take it. And we need to proclaim the message of the Bill of Rights with the passion of Patrick Henry. When we take that message across America and we tell people that, one, we do care about those who live in poverty and care about those who are unemployed, and we take the message of hope and growth and opportunity, we're going to be the dominant party. I want to be part of that, and I hope you do too. Thank you very much.